some mean which changes over time and a covariance matrix which changes over time. And so here's you know, a way of writing that mean and covariance matrix. But once we've done this, we immediately see that the distribution of the dependent variable given the independent variables is also going to be normally distributed and have an expression which we can write out. This is something that we know is a nice property of the normal distribution, but we also know that in a pro property like this holds under non-normality in, in uh, many cases as well. And you could start with this in, in, uh, even if it's not normally distributed. So what is the regression coefficient in this case? It's right here. It's the thing that multiplies x. And so this is an expression for what the dynamic conditional beta really is. And here's what it is. It's, it's the x prime x inverse matrix times the x prime y matrix. So we know that from our econometrics classes, x prime x inverse x prime y is an expression for a regression coefficient. But what's different here is the t on here. So we are not using just the simple x prime x. We are using our prediction of what the covariance matrix is going to look at, look like tomorrow using today's information. So it's a, an est a forecasted covariance between the x's and a forecasted covariance between the x and the y that tells you what the regression coefficients would be. And this tells you how much history you use in order to forecast what the, this regression coefficient would be. So we have a lot of statistical methods to estimate these h's, and we're going to use those methods to calculate what the beta is. So the problem gets changed into a problem of estimating volatilities and correlations between the x's and the x's and the y's, rather than a problem of forecasting what the beta is. And uh, in the one-factor model, this has been used quite a lot. In multi-factor models, I think this has not been uh, previously appreciated. We're going to use some sort of an estimate of what the covariance matrix is, and I'm going to use the dynamic conditional correlation method, which I think is one of the more robust and easy to use methodologies. So, as I said when we talked about, um, I need to be about done, don't I? Uh, when we talked about the uh, rolling regression, how do we know whether this beta is moving because we're getting a noisy, inefficient estimate of it, or whether it's moving because there's something really important happening? We'd like to test the hypothesis that beta is actually constant. How do we do that? Well, if you think about what these variance covariance matrix estimators really look like, and you look for example, in the one-dimensional case at the covariance between y and x divided by the variance of x, for no estimator that you can, that we've ever used, are there parameter values that make that constant. So the models that we use to estimate dynamic variances and covariances are not nested within the fixed beta model. This is a non-nested hypothesis testing problem, and so there are special solutions to this testing problem for non-nested problems. The most simple one is you can estimate it both ways and see which one fits better. So this is not a case where the dynamic model fits better. Sometimes it does, sometimes the fixed beta model fits better. We could do that. I like a second one even better, which is artificial nesting. So we can nest these fixed beta model and the varying beta model in the same model. You say, whoa, what is this going to look like? But wait till I show you. It's real simple. Or we could, we could do a third thing, which is uh, test, this, uh, test the first one. So uh, wait a minute. 
So here's what the artificial nesting looks like. You regress Y on X, that's the fixed beta. But you put another regressor in the model, which is X times the time varying beta, and you give it its own coefficient, gamma. So you have X in the model twice. Once with a time varying beta, and once without a time varying beta. So if this gamma is zero, we prefer the fixed beta. If this beta is zero, we prefer the time varying beta. But if they're both non-zero, we have a model which combines the fixed beta and the time varying beta. But actually, I think that's a good model to use. We can consider, even though we created this as an artificial nesting, we can actually think of it as a real nested model. This gives us protection against the idea that this beta is moving around too much. It's moving around in ways that are not, that are more noise and less signal, in which case the gamma is going to attenuate that effect. And so uh, that's what I'm going to show you, this artificially nested model. Um, this is a model we've applied to estimating systemic risk, and I talked about this last year uh, here. And we calculate for each financial institution the amount of capital this institution would need to raise if there's another financial crisis like the last one. Sound like a familiar statement. That's what we call the S risk. And if many banks have will need capital if we have another financial crisis. It makes the financial crisis almost self-fulfilling because these banks will be cutting their lending. That will reduce GDP. They will try to raise money. They will be unable to because no one wants to lend in a financial crisis. And the only source of money is going to be the taxpayer. And the taxpayers may say no in which case you get a, a GDP spiral downward, and that's why we think of this as a measure of systemic risk. So what happens if we look at the betas of Bank America? You see beta went up to two and a half or something like that during the financial crisis. It came back down again. It's now a little, it went up higher last summer, but now it's falling again, and it's only a little bit bigger than one for Bank of America. That actually is very good for the terms of the actual the systemic risk. If you look at J.P. Morgan Chase, this is when they announced the whale, the, uh, this big loss in their, uh, their credit uh, portfolio, but that didn't last too long. It's, it's dropped back down, and it's actually come back pretty much to one as well. And if you calculate the S risk for Bank of America, you see it was, this is, says Bank of America would have needed, say, $150 billion to be rescued at the height of the financial crisis, not too far from where, what it needed. Came back down, it went up some more, but it's now actually uh, down to uh, just a little over 100,000. Banco do Brazil, notice, had a beta that did not go up during the financial crisis particularly, was not stressed, it was not more correlated with the macro economy during the financial crisis. It's gone up some at the end here, not, not dramatically. And, but its S risk has gone up, partly because I think the leverage has increased for, for the Banco do Brazil, and maybe it's gone up because the stock price has gone down as the Brazilian economy has softened. So here is what our risk ranking looks like, and this is all from VLAB. You can see this. I saw it, looked at it in my hotel room this morning. This is our, our most systemically risky firm is Bank of America, followed by Citi, JP Morgan, Goldman, MetLife, Morgan Stanley, Prudential, Manulife. And then here's Banco de Brazil, number nine in the, in the uh, Americas. That's why I showed you that. Then we have like the Canadian banks, Royal Bank of Canada, Bank of Montreal, Bank of Nova Scotia, Toronto Dominion, and so forth on down. And, but you can see that the top three are by far the biggest in the S risk. Then it drops down to 40s, 30s, 20s, and so forth. So 
we follow this all the time. And it's interesting to see how that's happening. It's especially interesting to look at it in Europe, where we see here's Deutsche Bank on the top of our list. 140 billion is what we think it would cost to rescue Deutsche Bank. Then we have Barclays, followed by the French banks, BNP, Credit Agricole, and Socgen, and uh, Royal Bank of Scotland. These are all over $100 billion. We're worried about Spain, but where's Santander? Santander is down here, 60 billion. So that's small potatoes compared to the, the biggest banks. I think the financial crisis is going to uh, come to a head when we start worrying about the, the French banks, actually. So how do we apply this to commodities? We're going to do the same thing for commodities that we've been doing for, uh, for the systemic risk. We're going to model the return on the asset price as a function of the return in the equity market. And it turns out you need a lag in the return in the equity market because there is dynamics in the commodity prices that uh, you would not expect in a fully efficient market. There's some liquidity effects that I think make commodities move more slowly in response to global equity prices. It seems only to be a one-day lag, but there is a fair amount of autocorrelation in these spot returns, and we need to make sure we capture that, otherwise we don't see the full effect. So um, here's what the betas look like for commodities. Now here we have aluminum, copper, and nickel. Notice here, beta of zero. In 2000, the beta was about zero. Little positive, goes up a little bit. We get a, some effect on, uh, on nickel and copper here, but nothing on aluminum. Aluminum is still zero. We get to 2008, and all of a sudden, the betas shoot up to around one or so. But this, this is a dramatic change in the way the commodities respond to equities, the covariance between commodities and equities. Investors say this is when their th diversification broke down. They thought commodities were going to give them a hedge against the equity markets, but when the betas went up or the correlations went up, it wasn't nearly as good a hedge as they thought. And these betas never got above one and a half, I guess, and at the end they've come back down again to some number less than one, but considerably bigger than zero. If you look at the uh, precious, oh, and, and this is the nested model, it looks kind of the same. If, if, and, oh, and then what's the lag effect? If the lag effect is, a, is an illiquidity effect, then we can be interested in where the illiquidities are the greatest. And here we see that they're greatest in nickel, and they have been there since the beginning, but they actually got bigger before the financial crisis and went back down during the financial crisis. So that it may be that the, that the increased transaction rate and so forth reduced this uh, illiquidity measure, uh, at least temporarily during the financial crisis, for nickel, it seems to have come back up again, but for the other two, it's stayed back down again, stayed, stayed low. If you do the same thing for precious metals, you see that the beta has actually stayed pretty close to zero all the way through till most recently it, it went up some, but only really for silver. Silver was the biggest, platinum was second, and gold doesn't really show that big an increase in its beta. In fact, in many areas, beta is negative for gold, which corresponds to the fact that it's negatively correlated with equities in, uh, often. Um, and here's what the gamma looks like. The main effect is for, the, for silver. Here, the same thing for energy. You see a more varied picture, but you see the same increase in most of these betas during the financial crisis. The one that doesn't seem to move very much is uh, uh, the natural gas beta seems to stay small. I'm not quite sure why that is. 
Agricultural commodities, again, sort of similar. And if you look at the ordinary least squares beta, that's in blue. And if you look at the last beta, actually beta plus gamma, you see these numbers are much bigger, suggesting a much more of a relationship between equities and uh, commodities than you would see if you just did this least squares regression that we uh, considered. And so finally, we want to calculate what the long run marginal expected shortfall looks like, and these are the numbers. So we think that if there's a financial crisis like the last one, aluminum, the expected value of aluminum prices would be off by a little more than 30 percent. Copper is 40 percent, and nickel, it's uh, maybe 45. Some of these agricultural commodities is lower. Gold especially is lower. And here's what it looks like over time. You can see it, it got as low as uh, 50 or 60 percent negative for some of these commodities. But now toward the end, it's coming back uh, in toward zero. So the question is, can we use this to get a better idea of what the risks are in this business? I think so, actually. And I think these are techniques that can be used to forecast long-run risk and make better decisions based on that information. So I think one of the most dramatic effects that we've seen is this increase in beta for all these commodities, but especially the metals. Uh, around the financial crisis, and then to some extent the decay of, of these prices. So looking forward, you really do wonder, will the betas go back up again, or will they stay at the middle, or will they go back down again? And this is a question that I think is very important in trying to analyze these, uh, these markets. So with that, let me stop and uh, invite you to my favorite cafe, which is the Arch Cafe. Thank you. There's one behind you. Professor Engel, that was a fascinating presentation. You spoke about the volatility as well as the betas, and I understood from your presentation that commodity betas rose very sharply during the um, global financial crisis. So what is your bottom line from the point of view of, say, a retail investor looking for a diversification strategy including commodities. From a long-term risk perspective, does it still make sense to include commodities as part of the uh, um, basket? Because it looks like in really bad times, nothing saves you. Everything is correlated. Um, but then you did show many of the betas coming down. And for some things like natural gas and gold, the betas didn't rise very much. So do, do commodities really belong in a well-diversified basket? Well, I, I don't. I, I don't think I've quite finished answering that question for my own satisfaction, but I think that is exactly the interesting question, that clearly commodities are not as great a diversification as, as they used to be, uh, as we thought they were originally. And so if what, what I'm trying to do and haven't done yet is to simulate the same way I did for the univariate case, this bivariate process, and try to figure out what is the joint distribution looking forward of, of uh, equities and commodities, and therefore figure out what would be uh, tail sensitive portfolios that could, could take advantage of that. Um, you know, I think what, what I'm going to find is that when you look at the extremes, the extremes will be where they started. And so we'll see how much this diversification effect is reduced by 
by the dynamics of this process. And, and I think my guess is it's not going to go away. It just won't be as good as we think it is. I've answered them all. Oh, here we go. Thank you. <laughs> Good morning. Very interesting talk. Just following up on the uh, portfolio diversification implications, you're looking at spot pricing, right? Near term right. forward contracts. And the, the returns on those are pretty close to zero. Uh, so you're looking at the variance aspect, but there right. is the rate of return aspect. Right. And generally, if you look at spot prices, they're lousy investments, uh, and they differ substantially from uh, rolling futures contracts. Mm -hmm. so, it would, so I guess if I was um, trying to look at portfolio decisions, I guess I'd want to look at investments in various futures contracts. And then wouldn't we want measures of volatilities on those rather than the near-term futures, which is essentially a spot Well, you, you would you certainly want the investment in, uh, you'd want to consider the volatility of what you're going to invest in. That's, I, I, I agree on that completely. Um, my understanding is that when you build these uh, futures models, those are often, t they're typically tied to spot, but maybe not. Um, you know, I have no expected returns in here, so I don't see whether whether these are actually bad investments or not. I mean, Goldman's view of these indices, and they have ETFs traded on, on many of these, is that these are actually investable products and investable uh, prices. So maybe it would be silly of anybody to be long these. They ought to regularly be short them, but uh, you can't. You can't make a market that way. So anyway, yeah, I, I would agree. It's much more interesting if I have a full futures market grafted on top of this. I could really do all the, the same sort of thing. But you have to deal with the, with the rollover part. I mean, the r rollover, you know, often is not costless in these in these markets. So anyway, you have to, you have to be, uh, well, I'm sure, I'm sure you're more aware of this than I am, but uh, you have to actually do it right. Yeah, have a, if you do compare uh, Google with uh, GM, you have like a, a software, and a software it's like uh, infinite. Uh, you know, it, you can't count the, the 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 how much you can get get out of it. But GM it's like fixed, okay? <laughs> okay. Um, if you you get that and you get to to commodities, commodities also are like GM, right? And the the market itself. It's like uh, Google. Then you can expe speculate much more with the market itself than with the commodities, I think, because they are like fixed. What do you think about this idea? Um, just, just, one. Yeah. Uh, just say that. Uh, and also, I, I'd say that I, I think that during the, 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 the big crisis, I mean the, the main moment of the crisis, maybe somebody wants something fixed, something that can be touched, mm. like GM in some way. But when you go to speculate, it's much better, it's much easier to speculate with uh, like Google, you know? Uh, I remember that uh, in some, some time when you, you used to, to look at uh, you know, like prices for, for like GM, they, they were not real because they need to compete with the uh, software uh, 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 market, 
you know they they many many uh companies that were really uh uh physical they need to to do to create magic to compete with software uh companies so there's a question of where do these what what determines the average level of volatility for different kinds of assets Google has a higher volatility than GM. Why is it? Well, maybe it's more leverage. Maybe it's more of a growth stock so that, so that we're seeing you know, small changes have uh, predicted effects in the distant future and their present discounted value is much bigger than the same kinds of innovations in, in GM. I think that's exactly right. I think that's why typically why these small cap stocks have higher volatilities than large cap stocks because their you know their futures are more have more upside but also more downside actually GM has a fair amount of downside maybe not anymore but it, <laughs> it, um, so where do metals fall in this I mean I could see your point is maybe maybe there is not so much leverage in in these commodities it's surprising that there is, but of course, when you invest, if you invest through futures, you can produce infinite leverage almost. And so the high leverage is really not so visible in the spot market as it is in the way people actually trade it. Um, so there's probably something in what you're saying. Okay, so uh, I invite people to ask questions to Professor Engel at the coffee break. Uh, and uh, now let's uh, pass the floor to Professor Liet Gemma. So, good morning, everyone. Uh, I first would like to say that it is my honor uh, to be speaking here this morning. Uh, and I am grateful uh, to Vale, who sponsored the event, to Professor Isler and his collaborators, uh, who organized it, and to this audience. Secondly, I want to say that I'm very happy to be here in the beautiful city of Rio, in the heart of Brazil, which is the first letter of the BRICS, B as Brazil, B as BRICS. And we know that the economy in this country continues to be vibrant and continues to grow, and hopefully will help save the Europe, which is my first country, and the US, which is my second country. When I am in Europe, I hear that this horrible financial crisis was imported from the US, the collapse of the CDO market, the mortgage market, and so on and so forth. And it does have some truth and a lot of truth. And when I am in the US, which is my second home, I hear that everything is going to come from Europe, all the bad news, uh, Italy, Spain, Greece, France, and so on and so forth. So finally, I am better off being here with you in Brazil. And I enjoy it. And thirdly, I certainly would like to express my honor to be speaking after Professor Robert Engel. And interestingly, we had not coordinated, but hopefully we will be complementary. And I hope that you will get something from the combination of our two talks. Okay, so I have been doing commodities for many years now. And uh, I hope I will be able to manipulate that. So uh, I'm not uh, advertising for that. Uh, my uh, publisher gets more, much of the money. But I would like to say that in my first life, I used to be an expert in exotic option pricing using changes of measure, uh, best sell processes, and all kinds of complicated mathematics and probability. But I tell you, 
Uh, after 18 years in commodities, I tell you, this is not the most fascinating part of the story. Commodities are definitely the most fascinating part of the story. And in fact, in the old days when I was going to dinner and I was pr pricing Asian options and double barrier, nobody wanted to sit next to me. Today, everybody wants to sit next to me. They want to know whether they should continue to buy gold, whether corn prices are going to continue to go up, whether ethanol has a bad impact on the prices of corn, and so on and so forth. And I will, I will try to address some of these issues in my talk today. So, you may ask a question where, when we go along, in principle, I'm not totally uh, disturbed. So firstly, uh, commodities is my subject. And commodities, we used to say a new asset class. Then we asked whether it was a unique asset class, namely metals, energy, and agricultures, or a multi-asset class. At the start, we said it was a multi-asset class, and I will try to advocate that the amount of correlation that we see is growing as time grows, not only with the other asset classes like equities, which have been beautifully discussed, but also between commodities. And this country, Brazil, has it all. Brazil has crude oil, and this is energy, of course. Brazil has plenty of agriculture not only sugarcane, but wheat and soybean and so on. And Brazil has a lot of metals, and Valle has a lot of metals in Brazil and all over the world. Okay, so in any case, I could go back to the beginning of humankind because we should remember that commodities have existed since the beginning of humankind. Finance, as a kind of stupid herd behavior, never paid attention to them, but it has been there for a long time and they will be there for a long time. They are not going to be outdated pretty soon. So if we look at commodities over the last 30 years, we can observe uh, two decades of flat prices, in fact decreasing if we adjust for inflation, and low volatility. And at the same time, we had low correlations with the other asset classes that I won't have the time to discuss, but between the three subgroups of commodities. Then we got the new decade, and I will try in my talk not to mix up what happened in commodities and the financial crisis. So as much as I can, I will try to avoid the financial crisis, and I will try to make my point comparing the 80s and 90s to the 2000 up to 2007. Because during the first years of the 2000s, that's when everything took place. Oil prices started going up in a remarkable way as of 2002, $20 in 2002, $70 in 2007. Metals starting go started going up some time later, like in 2004, we shall see, and then agriculturals in 2005, 2006. So consequently, we see that the increase in commodity prices has nothing to do with the financial crisis, has plenty to do with prices which were depressed for too long. Commodity are produced in uh, developing countries, in developed countries. Anybody needs to be rewarded for the labor cost, for their output, for the capex and all the money which is invested. Okay, so that's what I'm trying to, to mention here. And at the same time, as you know, we got around the world deregulation, deregulation of electricity markets in the US and it was my first life in commodities. In fact, it was electricity and then crude oil, natural gas, and so on. And not only deregulation, but at the same time, the long-term contracts which used to exist, let's say, between uh, Vale or Rio Tinto or BHP and the steel makers in China or India just broke down. The three big companies decided that's it. We don't like these long-term fixed contracts. We want prices to move as the demand grows. And that happened a short time ago, and we shall see the implication in particular in terms of the forward curve. Okay, and lastly, 
we shall see that correlations appeared all over the place between the, this asset class and equities and between the different pieces of this asset class. And if I may, I will attribute two sources to these correlations. Firstly, the fact that they are created by the, the action of financial players. If all of us today decide to buy massively silver, at the end of the day, prices of silver will go up. So what I'm trying to say is that over the last 10 years, we have seen plenty of money going into commodities, in particular in the commodity indexes mentioned by Professor Engel. I am myself on the board of the UBS Bloomberg Commodity Index. And obviously, this is what we call passive long. We are passive long invested in commodities called gold, copper, crude oil, and prices go up for this reason. The second reason that I will try to emphasize, and which is to me fascinating, is substitution between commodities. Corn prices get very high, we turn to wheat. Uh, um, crude oil prices get too high, we turn to natural gas, in the US in particular, and modestly, if I may, this may explain your flat beta in the case of gas, because we've got in the US natural gas fracking, and we got a massive amount of gas now, and even before. And lastly, we have competition for rare resources called electricity, called water, called land. We, you, you are miners, I am in the, the farm business. You want water, I want water. You want land, I want land. You need electricity, I need electricity. So consequently, we should not be surprised that driven by the same needs, eventually, this has an impact on the prices exposed. Okay? And if I may, scarcity is a fundamental element. We should never think that we will have enough forever. Uh, whether you believe that Malthus were, was right or not, we know that when we are going deeper into the mine, it is more costly, it is more dangerous, and consequently, it is going to be eventually more expensive at the end of the day. Okay, so here, in a nutshell, what I try to explain, that during that time period, Commodity prices were just flat, all the way to 202. This is the oldest commodity index, the CRB, Commodity Research Bureau, which is essentially a proxy for inflation in the US. And you see that my basket of commodities is totally flat. I remember in 2001, I was working for Louis Dreyfus in agricultural commodities, and the, there was a charming uh, young intern. She was from Argentina, and she was building the, pro the, the trajectory of soybean prices and corn prices adjusted for inflation, and they were declining remarkably, and she felt so sorry, and she was asking me why this was happening at the same time when we had this gigantic growth in the stock market for Cisco, Google, Intel, IBM, and so on. So my modest view is that we got too low prices for too long, and eventually they, this needed to stop, and it, indeed it stopped. It went all the way up to the middle of 2008. As you know, at the time when everybody was desperate for cash, they were selling everything, and then prices went up, and as you see, we are much higher than the highest point. So consequently, the financial crisis finally did not leave any trace as far as commodities are concerned. So, uh, speaking of correlation, uh, I have a few slides of this nature. This one is related to equity, and as you see, very interestingly, in the old days, uh, the equity, the Brazilian equity index, and the UK one were fairly decorrelated, and then we got the spillover effects in the equity market, and we, we got this increasing correlation in the world of stocks, as you know, worldwide. But not only that, if I look now at US equity as opposed to a world metals index, they used to be essentially decorrelated 
for a long time, as you see, positive, negative, whatever. And lately, they have been increasing remarkably because eventually the same investors were putting their money in US stocks and copper and nickel and the other base metal what we call risk on, risk off. One day, everybody is risk averse. We are selling everything. We get out. We go into cash. The day after, the market is happy. And when the market is happy, the market buys equity and the market buys metals. The market believes that the future is going to be bright. You see here that, in contrast, if I compare US equity with agriculturals, uh, the correlations were flat and essentially continue to be very small today because the number of financial players who go to agriculturals is not yet high. They are getting more numerous every day, but for some reason, financial investors decided that metals and energy were easier. They can trade crude oil because it's easy, but trading corn and wheat belongs to the so-called commodity trading advisors. But if I meet you, and I hope so, in two years, we shall see that the correlation between US equity and agricultural index will become much higher. This is US equity versus energy, and obviously, as you see, st the correlation started increasing as of 2000, and if you paid attention, the starting point was not the same for all of them. I have plenty of PhD students on different subjects, and we study what we call in econometrics, uh, if I may, because it's not, I am more a, a probabilist, but in any case, what we study, uh, called breaks in trajectory. When can we claim using whatever criterion uh, that we have a clear change in trajectories? So metals obviously is a crucial subject worldwide and in these countries. Uh, if you read uh, the Wall Street Journal or the US Geological Survey, you hear indeed that we have plenty of reserves, not only in Brazil and all over the world, but in places which are far away called Greenland, Mongolia, the Arctic. We read that we had plenty of reserves for iron ore, for copper, for potash, which is a major fertilizer, as you know. But as I was trying to say before, it will become more and more costly, more and more dangerous, hence more expensive to protect human beings, hence the prices in the market will go higher in average, not next month, but in the next years. Okay, so reading or telling on his paper on exhaustible commodities, which is our case, metals are not renewed every year, like corn and wheat. He showed that the so-called shadow price of a resource has to grow at least at the rate of interest when this resource is exhaustible. So the idea of exhausting the planet should be on our mind, and maybe you follow the story of rare earth. I know that a brilliant professor in the foundation gave a talk recently on rare earth. China has decided they want to keep the rare earth for themselves, not only this generation, but the coming generations. The US needs rare earth. Many, Japan needs them, many countries need them. China, for the time being, produces 90%. They say, we don't want to export, we want to keep for our future generations. And there is nothing you can say. And now rare earth in China are placed under the Ministry of Env Environment and Protection of Reserves. And there is nothing you can say. You go to the World Trade Organization and so on, and you won't gain the dispute. OK, in any case, uh, I want to mention that some papers used his model, for instance, to copper mines in Canada, decided it was wrong. But this was the time of the years 90, when commodity prices were flat, what we call mean reverting. In my modest case, back in 2005, I wrote a paper entitled, Is Mean Reversion Dead in Commodity Prices? And I believe that in the long term, this statement is true. Okay, 
So in any case, uh, as well as the quality of what we exploit and so on. So let me keep going to show that the world is changing. On this graph, I represent in brown copper prices, in blue, the Baltic dry index. Shipping is obviously part of the commodity game. I am in Brazil. I want to send my copper. I want to send my uh, corn to the rest of the world, Egypt, China, and so on. So I need vessels. And Valley does have a large fleet of uh, personal vessels. So this is the Baltic dry index. This is the copper. We used to say, and anal uh, prestigious analysts used to say, that these two numbers were indicators of the growth of the world economies. They could let you know in advance whether the world economy was going to go up or down. As you see, my two trajectories used to move together. I'm not sure about the validity of the indicators, but they were essentially moving together. As of 2011 or so, we have com a complete decoupling. Copper prices continue to go up because China continues to need copper. And BDI prices collapsed. Why did they collapse? Because supply and demand is the number one and the number one million lesson in commodities. My supply of vessels is very large today because China has decided to build massively vessels in order to be independent. China needs some coal from Indonesia. China is going to send its own vessel to pick up the commodity. And now we have, we have the situation of very low prices, while in the case of copper, prices are not very low. Okay, that's what I call dislocation between BDI and copper prices. So as we know, and uh, as was mentioned in the previous talk, correlations obviously do not, say, do not stay stagnant over time. They are indeed dynamic. So uh, copper versus crude oil, as you see again, because in both cases, we are related to energy. Extracting crude oil consumes energy. Extracting copper certainly consumes energy. You see uh, an increase in correlation. If I produce crude oil in Canada, I use tar sands. And in order to crush the tar sands, I need water, I need energy. If I extract copper, I need water, I need energy. So uh, however, my, the comparison I was making has limits. So now to turn to something I won't have the time to discuss today. This you can't read too well. This is the volatility smile built on options on copper in, on April 4, 2012. And as you see, compared to the S&P 500 or crude oil, the number of points far away from the point at the money, which is roughly here, is fairly small. The copper market in terms of options is not yet quite developed today. It will be different in one or two years. In the case of crude oil, it is completely developed. In the case of crude oil, I can build what we call the implied volatility surface, namely the implied vol extracted from option prices in terms of strike and maturity. By far is crude oil the most advanced commodity market, in particular in terms of financial instruments. Gold comes next uh, with this representation with plenty of points of my uh, volatility smile, which was built recently. And as you see, my smile is skewed to the left because many buyers of gold are protecting their positions. As we know from Finance 102, when you hold an asset, you like to buy a put option in order to protect your position in case the prices go down, which, is, which has been lately the case of gold. So what is my point? My point is that before going to options, you need to start with forwards and futures. You need to start with the commodity spot market. You need to understand it to the tip of your fingers. Then you go to the forward and futures, and then you go to options. And you can't do otherwise. So going rapidly to the theory of storage that many of you know, we have some fundamental results that I'm going to review briefly. 
one which is very dear to me and which is extremely important, which is the fact that the volatility is high in the commodity spot price when inventory is low. So uh, over the last 10 years, I've been working in trading rooms with oil companies or uh, banks and so on. So let's say I am selling today an option on crude oil, or I am selling, let's say, an option or on copper or nickel. Okay, so firstly, I look at the so-called historical vol, the standard deviation that I compute easily from a time series. Message number one. Message number two, if the option market is fairly liquid, I will compute my implied vol. And that's what I showed in the previous pictures. Thirdly, because I understand, I believe somehow commodities, I know that inventory is a key quantity. Inventory is the amount of commodity which is going to allow me to face a rise in demand when the supply is not there. So consequently, I will use a third type of volatility, the one I called inventory-related volatility. So for my crucial little sigma, my volatility parameters, now I own three sources of information. And in average, over time, I may be better than you. I will make more money, possibly be bankrupt less often. Okay, and this does not exist essentially in the bond market where I used to work, nor in the equity market. Okay, the convenience yield, I will mention it rapidly, which is the benefit of owning the physical commodity. So basically, the more physical and primitive your commodity is, the better off you are, and today, more than ever. And lastly, which the question which was mentioned uh, in the back of the room earlier, the forward curves, namely that we can buy and sell the commodity today, but also three months down the road, six months, and so on. And consequently, the dynamics of the forward curve matters to me. And this dynamics is complicated. In my life with the spot, I look only at S, the spot price. And this may be complicated or simple. In my life with forward curve, I look at the three months contract, six months, 12 months, and so on. I look at a problem which is what we call infinite dimensional. Consequently, the dynamics of commodity forward curves is not totally elementary. And obviously, mining companies and other players of this nature do care about the dynamics of this forward curve because if I am Valet or if I am BHP, I am not going to hedge using the first nearby. I am going to hedge using 12 months futures or 20 months 20 or 24 or whatever. So consequently, the evolution of my whole forward curve does matter to me and not only the single spot price. Okay, and that's what I was trying to say here. Okay, so the forward curve, just to be properly defined, it is a collection of forward contracts for different maturities. When you work on interest rates, you build your yield curve this mo every morning. When you build, work on commodities, you build the forward curve. And as we know, the shape of the forward curve is a crucial piece of information. When you work on interest rates, you look at the shape of your yield curve. When you work on commodities, you look at the shape of the forward curve and all messages you can get. So in books of finance quite respectable, which, used to, which were written in the 70s and so on, we read that forward curves are mostly backward dated namely declining with the maturity of the future contract. And this was the case for crude oil in September 2007. Prior to the financial crisis, crude oil prices were high and the market was expecting them to go down and the forward curve was normally backward dated. And indeed, if I look at the spot price of crude oil between January 2002 and October 2007, we went from $20 to nearly 100, 
which is a gigantic number. We have a multiplier of five, which is amazing. Over five years, very few hedge funds in the planet can claim such a compound return over such a period. Mathematically, this is, for me, a quasi-perfect trajectory of a geometric Brownian motion, but this is not the point of my talk today. The point is that when you see crude oil prices rising like that, and you are here, you expect that prices will eventually go down, hence the forward curve we have seen before. Time goes by, and let me just recall rapidly what we call the spot forward relationship that we have in the world of currencies and that we have in the world of commodities, namely that under no arbitrage, the forward price is related to the spot price by the cost of financing, the cost of storage, and the dividend corresponding to the, the happiness of holding the physical commodity in my hand. So that's, the, and as you know, that in the FX market, you have here the domestic rate and here the, the foreign rate, okay? So we know that this relationship is fundamental at any time. In particular, it allows me to claim that any forward contract can be a substitute for, for my spot price. This is an equality. This is not correlation. So in the language of my friend and former PhD student, Nassim Taleb, I would say that my spot and forward contract are fungible. I need to hedge using S. I can't see S because the market is opaque. I will use any liquid forward contract. And again, this relationship is crucial to me in theory and in practice as well. So now we are looking at copper. We are in May 2008. The financial crisis is not totally there yet. And again, we have backwardation. I never make my curves better than what they are in the market. If there is a little blip, I leave it there. I just want to show the reality. There is no model here. I look at prices in the market and I plot the various maturities with the corresponding prices. My copper prices are sometimes from the LME, sometimes from the COMEX, but in principle, it should be written. So this is normal backwardation. Now, I go back to crude oil, which was backwardated. The financial crisis has absolutely appeared. Lehman has collapsed. Oil prices collapsed as well. They went from 100 to 55, and now my forward curve is in steep contango. The market expects prices to go up. And obviously, as you see here, you can build some nice positions using this shape. I don't have the time to discuss that today. What is my point? My point is that we used to have normal backwardation as of 2008. We had like normal contango, the situation of crisis. And lastly, we have humps. In my life on interest rates, I used to meet yield curves with a hump. In my life in commodities, as of 1994, I always saw shapes which were declining or increasing. And on that day, I was very happy because a clear hump was exhibited. My pink curve is the prices at which people are prepared to sell. My blue curve is the buying side. My bid ask is so small eight years down the road. I am sitting in a bank. We have phones of buyers and sellers, and I have a hunt. What does it mean? If I may, I have no time for modeling here, but what I want to say is the following. In the old days, in order to propose a simple dynamics for the evolution of my forward curve, I could use the spot and the spread, two state variables. And we are happy. We want as few state variables as we can. But as of that moment, my two state variables don't suffice. I need the th a third one. I need what we call curvature, the starting point 
the, the spread and the curvature exactly like we have got in interest rates, which means that mathematically, when you go to pricing options, it is going to be more complicated. Very interestingly, copper sometime later followed the same story, namely that we had the same hump in the shape of the forward curve. By the way, I have some modest proposals to explain this shape in relationship to commodity indexes and the rolling of the position, but I don't have the time, maybe at the break, so I will keep moving. And I will represent this forward curve that I built shortly before coming here. And as you see, we have a mild piece going up, so-called cantango, and then a large piece going down. And here we have nice liquidity until June 17, more than five years down the road. I stop any curve when the liquidity is gone. I don't like to quote prices when there is no liquidity, obviously. This is coal, and coal matters. Coal matters as a source of energy. Coal matters when you produce steel using, obviously, iron ore and coal. Uh, coal prices have collapsed like everybody else. However, the market expectation, we are here in the US. Coal has different prices because it travels well, but it is costly, it is heavy. So we have coal prices in the US, which is my curve, and we have coal prices in Singapore, and we have coal prices in Rotterdam. There is a cost of shipping, which comes into the story that I don't have the time to discuss this morning. So this is my coal forward curve, and I look at my shipping, and I devise my strategies using essentially commodities.